Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started on the next panel now. Um, this is one of my uh, favorite panels because it's actually regulatory. And it used to be that I'd look at the regulatory side and say, like, oh, that's going to be really boring when I saw it on a thing. But in the world of digital assets and digital currency, they often turn out that this is one of the most interesting aspects of, of the, uh, the industry. Because first of all, it's highly uncertain. And secondly, it's evolving into a kind of marketplace where there's competition between jurisdictions about the pathways for regulatory uh, guidance and, and these rules. So I think we're actually very lucky to have an incredible brain trust here. I wanted to position this as a fireside chat because uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really kind of uh, in-depth discussion about where the rules are going. And leading it is uh, Sean, who is the head of the UK uh, Digital Currency Association Regulatory Committee. So this is a person who's been in all over Europe with regulators here in the UK, the ECB, the XYZ, talking about uh, the implications of these technologies. And then next to that is Roger, time from Hogan Levels, really focusing on the UK perspective. And then Grant Fondo, who's, I'm surprised, not asleep, because he came all the way in from San Francisco, uh, looking at the Silicon Valley, California, New York, uh, DFS perspectives. So Sean, take it away. Oh, right. Well, it's getting quite hot here, I have to tell you. <laughs> um, I suppose um, the real starting point is what this crypto stuff is, because it's hard for regulators and for uh, legislators, to, well, regulators, to do anything with it unless they actually know in which, in which pigeonhole to, to put it. Um, do you guys have any thoughts about where this crypto stuff should be put? Well, in, in Europe and in the UK, at the moment, it doesn't quite fit in any pigeonhole neatly. Uh, various of the authorities have looked at it and they've said that, well, it's not really funds as defined under the Payment Services Directive. It's not e-money. There isn't a financial institution we can get our hands on for the purposes of money laundering directive. That's generally the position. Obviously, it depends on you know, the particular characteristics of the currency and the activity that's carried out in relation to it. But at the moment, it doesn't fit neatly anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and really, you'd have to look at what are the particular characteristics. It is something. You know, there are arrangements, there are activities that law and regulation can bite on. So there could be criminal activity in relation to it. There are general consumer protection laws that apply if there is if it's B2C generally. And so it's not completely out of any framework at all. It just doesn't fit neatly in any framework. And I guess in different um, jurisdictions, even within the EU, there isn't a common view about how the various aspects that are identifiable that fit somewhere into something, how they should be applied. It's very mm. different, isn't it? Yes, I mean, um, there have been different views taken. Now, um, there is a question, actually, which is, is it just that different authorities, regulators, legislators are just taking their time at different rates to get to the same view in the end? Or actually, are they really taking different views such that we have a bit of a mess. In fact, I think we have a bit of a mess. Um, there is a timing aspect, but in fact, you know, for example, uh, the Banque de France um, came out and looked at one particular scheme and said, actually, there is a payment service there. You've got a customer at one end, a customer at the other end. There is a payment happening. Um, but that's not a general view throughout Europe. On the, on the tax side, you know, some authorities are looking at either whatever you want to call it, digital, virtual, cryptocurrency, either like money or like a commodity, like a, like a piece of property or like an investment. And they're looking at it differently and therefore applying tax rules to it differently. Mm -hmm. So we don't yet have any real 
homogeneity, even in Europe, where we're meant to have a lot of common principles applying. And of course, in the States, and in New York in particular, um, there's no doubt about what it is and what you should do with it, or at least so, so, so the New York um, Department of Financial Services would have very clear ideas about you know, what it should do with this stuff. And, and as a 46-page a um, bit license proposal that's pretty close now, isn't it, to, yep. to becoming a, a reality. It's going through a couple of stages of consultation. So a very different approach there. It is. It's, so it's interesting. And what you have in the states is you have two systems. You have the federal system and the state system. And then within the state system, there's 50 different jurisdictions. So with New York, and I think New York's been a leader, and I think that the Bitcoin um, license is now you know digital currency license. Actually, when you read it, it's actually, I think, in some ways fairly well written. Like, you can plow through it and kind of understand it. Um, now, I think there's problems with it, and I think applying it to businesses and especially startup businesses, there's a, there's a number of issues, and maybe we'll get into that later. But I do think, I think generally in the U.S., they've figured out that this is a currency. It's a different type of currency. Not every jurisdiction has said it's a currency. Texas has said it really doesn't fit within its definition. But I think generally you see that they treat it as a currency. I'm pretty confident. I'm a former federal prosecutor, criminal federal prosecutor. So I'm pretty confident that if you launder Bitcoin, they'll, they'll figure out that it's a currency and put you in jail for doing it. So, but at the IRS, you look at the IRS, it says that it's property. And so you know, these agencies are figuring out, you know, they're much further along than they were a year ago. But they're figuring out, much like the internet, you know, the internet you know, was this new paradigm, and they've put it into these old historic boxes. And now you see, like in New York, for example, um, they're changing those boxes, although they're still trying to fit, fit it in kind of the historic paradigm. And do you think perhaps New York has jumped the gun? I mean, there's a, there's a, a, a whereas the European approach generally is a much more um, leisurely route to, to deciding how to treat something new. Um, new York seems to have said, well, it's moving, let's shoot at it, and, and we'll worry about you know, whether, we, you know, whether, whether, we, whether we kill it or not afterwards. I think so. I, th I think it's, there's a mixed answer to that, because I think you talk to, you know, I, talk, I advise companies about these regulations, and there's a lot of uncertainty. And any time there's uncertainty, it's hard to invest. And where do we put our money? Where do we put our time? If we go into this jurisdiction, are they going to essentially retroactively say this law applies and bang you for it? And I've seen that happen. And so where there is the more leisurely approach has that risk of once we get around to it, we're going to turn around and say that thing you were doing the last year, that's criminal. Or that's violations of security laws. Or that's violation of FinCEN regulations. And so there's a real risk there. So I think what New York is doing is in one level good where there's certainty, you can at least factor that in. You can say, okay, it, we, it costs, it's going to cost us X amount of dollars to do this regulation. I think the concern that I personally have with New York is that it's not a, it's not a startup friendly provision. I mean, they have a provision, you know, I mean, it's, so for example, you change your business model really in any significant way, you got to get permission to do that. Not too many, not too many startups don't change their model every six months, right? Um, I, as a lawyer who advise people, I get phone calls all the time and I say, oh, this might be a problem. They say, oh, no, that was, we, we're not doing that anymore. We're doing something different. And so that's a real problem. The whole, M you know, the M what I call the M&A provision, where you have to get permission from New York to sell your company. And they're going to tell you in 120 days whether you can do it. Well, in Silicon Valley, major deals get done within a week. And so the idea that you've got to wait three months and then wait some additional time should they need more time, or four months, I should say, and need more time, is not business friendly. So these, and these compliance requirements are extraordinarily expensive. And so, you know, preserving these records, saving all your marketing information for seven years, that's extraordinary. And, 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 in now, and nowadays, it's not like you're just printing brochures. Nowadays it's, you know, text, it's blogs, there's a blog, you know, all those types of things. That's an extraordinary burden for, for companies that are evolving where turnover changes, literally a company is a totally new, new group of people after, after you know, uh, a year or two. And so those, those are, are aspects that are, I think are, make it very difficult and kind of scary to go to New York mm -hmm. at times. 
And on the, the point of, of certainty, I mean, without certainty, business can't really scale. Um, but also without trust on the user side, that can inhibit scale as well. So what <coughs> gives certainty and trust? There's, there are lots of checks and balances built in to the blockchain. But in terms of that regulatory overlay, I'm a great fan of proportionate and tiered regulation to fit the level of risk and impact that uh, prob and problems that could be caused. So for example, for say a startup that's having a very small impact, doesn't pose any unusual risks, leave it. There are laws out there already, let it grow a bit. As the market develops, as you appreciate that there are bigger impacts, then maybe there's a place for self-regulation, common standards, you know, proper dispute resolution process. Then as it grows further, that's when I think full authorization is needed, proper licensing, proper conduct rules and prudential standards. So, you know, it's sort of horses for courses and, and the right level of regulation at the right stage of development. Otherwise, you risk strangling at birth, you know, something that has wonderful possibilities. Now, the first iteration of, of the New York Bit license proposal um, encompassed basically anybody touching crypto other than consumers and merchants and just any kind of business touching it or any developer of anything that involved um, uh, a, a digital currency in any way, shape or form um, uh, was caught by it. And that, that was sort of toned down a little bit, made clearer, and there were more exclusions thrown in. Roger, are you saying that you would like to see something that's very broad and encompassing everybody touching crypto, or you see that in a more narrow uh, 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 um, um, application? Well, it's more where the virtual touches the real, I think. So at, at the point of contact between virtual currency and real Fiat you know, currency. money, fiat yeah. currency. Yeah. Um, at those points, so exchanges, for example, are an obvious place, and, and they've been hit on. And um, in the UK, our Treasury has just proposed that exchanges should be subject to anti-money laundering requirements. And so that's, that's being recognised, not, not just in the UK. Um, you know, and then you look, look out wider trading platforms, others who are involved, really interesting area is, is there any, or can you get your hands on any governing body um, in a distributed structure to who you can then regulate and enforce against? Yes, and the, the, the European Banking Authority um, had something to say about that last year in their opinion, didn't they? they um, their proposal was that if you were going to uh, have a virtual currency operating in the EU, then it had to have an entity as a governance authority um, that for that currency that was accountable and um, uh, domiciled within the European Union so that there was somebody you could actually mm. grab hold of. And of course that goes totally against the grain of any of the decentralized approaches, mm. not of course against uh, uh, sort of Preston's um, uh, project we were talking about earlier on. I uh, can't see where Mr. Marmot is. Uh, he's, he's not joined us. Um, but um, the, 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 that's fine because those, are for, the, the, those, those approaches are for you know, harnessing the blockchain within, um, uh, so, uh, within trusted organizations within the enterprise context or some other um, uh, entity. Whereas the, the run of the mill Bitcoin and altcoin is, you know, the genies are out, already outside mm. the box. There is no governing authority and probably never will be for many of them. And, and the EBA's approach was to say, a recommendation anyway, was to say, well, if it's not one of this kind of accountable uh, governed virtual currencies, then it has to remain outside the regulated, um, uh, the regulated sector altogether. It can exist, but it can't interact at all with the regulated sector. And if it wants to be mm -hmm. taken within the regulated sector then uh, and become part of that, and, and for you to be able to um, bank it and interchange with it in, in, mm. in the fiat world, then you'd need to have a governing 
authority for each currency that could reverse an info uh, reverse transactions effectively and, and mm. on, upon whom um, various actions could be could be enforced yes and they sort of begrudgingly acknowledge that <coughs> um, bank accounts could be opened at least for those involved with virtual currencies uh, because that's another issue whether whether the traditional banks um, will actually deal with those who operate in the virtual currency world. And, and I think that's, that's a good point. Like in the US, so mm. all regulation is not bad. And I think these, these, in the US, there's a real concern about consumers. As mentioned, I was a prosecutor. I saw people who has money were stolen, and it is devastating. And that's part of what regulators are worried about. They're worried about any time money, whether it's virtual currency or anything other type of currency, is moving, that is, that, is there accountability? Do we know who's moving the money? Is, if the money is lost, can we get it? Can we find it? Is there someone who will pay back that consumer? So, and I think as a business is, you know, the credit card system works pretty well. It's been around for a long time because you know how to use it. If someone steal, hacks your credit card, the issuing bank's going to pay the money back, et cetera. Likewise, I think that's where the digital currency is moving towards is a little bit more of security, a little bit more user friendliness. And I think the re you know, New York, to its credit, has tried to, to you know, address some of the concerns, legitimate consumer concerns. I think they've listened to the digital currency community. I think there's a lot of people who are not happy with the byproduct. I think they, many people probably feel it was better. The second version is better than the first version. But they are listening, and I think regulators are listening. But typically, most regulators are a couple of years behind technology, as, as many people in middle America is behind where you know, Silicon Valley is. And so, but I think a lot of currency companies are realizing also to get the trust of the consumers, the trust of the banks, the trust of the industry players, they are starting to have to adopt more KYC procedures, things of that nature, um, not only for regulatory reasons, but for pure business reasons. I think um, the approach in the States, though, isn't universal, is it? Uh, you've got a, 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 by contrast with the 46-page New York document, you've got a four-page California bill, albeit mm -hmm. uh, on a completely different scale. Um, so a different approach. And if I, if I remember correctly, t is it Texas that, 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 that said, you know, it's Wild West country here. Come, come, come bring your big crypto businesses here. We, we don't want to regulate this stuff. Yeah, no, I mean... So, yeah, California is, is, <coughs> is very different than New York's, for example. And I think that's the problem for companies, is give us one set of regulations, we'll fight about what's good or bad, and we know at least what to expect. But to, to, to tell a company, especially startup companies, okay, you've got to register with FinCEN and they have certain regulations. Now you've got to register with New York, you've got to register with California, you've got to register with Washington. And then there's about 46 or 47 other states that you've got to make a judgment call about whether you're registered or not. Are they going to get upset? And so that's a huge burden for any company. But imagine a company that's got six employees and a, and a million dollars in finance, which is actually a lot for a startup. And so that's, that's the dichotomy of a system that is, I think everyone's trying to do the right thing, but it's not the real world when you're dealing with, with these startups that you don't want to spend 75% of your budget on compliance. And the European approach is just so very different. Um, it's, um, well, if we take the UK, for example, the um, UK government um, last month uh, on Budget Day published its uh, response to the call for information. And what was really telling, I felt there, was that it went well beyond just the legal and regulatory aspects, uh, but was a, 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 a holistic, a joined up government approach. In other words, I think probably the only government I'm aware of that's actually got a, a government policy on the subject of digital currencies. Mm. So it's, Pending it's, the election. Yes. Well, absolutely. Yes. Uh, although in the UK DCA, we talk a lot to, to all the parties. And interestingly enough, there isn't a lot of difference in, in, in the mm. position of, of most of them. They, 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 they all have a view that this stuff is broadly um, probably good for the country if we can stimulate um, fintech, and it's a part of that whole scene. Um, that's good for the country. It will bring some of those Silicon, Dal uh, Silicon Valley dollars to, uh, uh, to, 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 to Silicon Roundabout and to, to the UK. So that's a good thing. And we can get some real businesses um, um, and startups 
happening here in the UK. So it's actually something to be encouraged. Mm -hmm. And so the place for regulation, Roger, you mentioned um, the intention, this government's intention mm -hmm. anyway, to, to apply anti-money laundering mm -hmm. uh, regulations to exchanges and others at the fiat crypto uh, interface. Um, that's just part of a complete package um, of, 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 of which also included endorsement of self-regulation to deal with the consumer protection aspects. So we've got public policy issues of mm. anti-money laundering and uh, uh, terrorist financing and sanctions and so on. On the one hand, we've got um, self a proposal to support self-regulation for consumer protection, and we've got um, ten million dollars, a uh, ten million pounds. pounds sorry, yeah. forgive me. <laughs> um, uh, to to uh, uh, being being. Uh, um, made available to uh, mm. further research um, uh, this whole sector. So this is a, a, a total a holistic government approach. I don't think the states has a position on it. I don't think any other country has a position on it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually, I think, a good step in the right direction. Um, seems right for this time. Um, in terms of the aspect of outside of anti-money laundering, they're also looking at getting the right tools for the enforcement authorities, police, etc., to actually apply the law as it is now to this new world. Mm. And that's, that's a very interesting area because, you know, ha how do you get your hands on the right people? It is, by its nature, largely anonymous or, or as many are saying, pseudonymous because you can trace to a certain extent and perhaps by putting together with other, other information you, you could identify. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there's a lot of work to do in terms of being able to apply today's rules to that, frame, that world mm. um, versus bringing in a new framework for the new world. Yes. Well, the, 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 it's interesting mm. because the... the um, Discussions that, that uh, have been going on with uh, Financial Action Task Force, for example, about adapting their approach to anti-money laundering mm. to take account of the new, you know, the challenges of this new stuff. The, 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 they're actually open to, to to this discussion because they recognise that to be close to that discussion is simply going to drive uh, drive it underground. Money will flow any which way, and so it's better to be part of the system and to um, uh, and to adapt the. The, the, the AML frameworks that exist today are all rooted in the last century and, uh, and dealt with, perhaps adequately, um, uh, perhaps not, depends on whether you feel the return's been worth it, but um, deals with the, 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 that conventional financial world, that mm. payments world. And it's not just in crypto, but in other areas, um, uh, f uh, financial innovation um, there are new challenges being thrown up and the, the rules have to be revisited and the frameworks have to be revisited so that the same, the original, um, the original uh, objectives uh, are, are met, public policy and uh, objectives are met, but by different means. And that's, that's an interesting conversation that's, that's going on. That may actually help the banking scenario because you touched on, on banking earlier on and I think um, often banks throw up the regulatory burden. There certainly is a risk, uh, an elevated risk for them in this space, but it, it's a risk that actually some would argue is manageable. There are banks like Fedor that are managing this risk quite well. Mm -hmm. um, they've just adapted, they've applied the risk-based approach yes. and are doing it properly. Mm -hmm. And indeed, Fat, uh, FATF have also quite exercised at the moment about bank de-risking uh, uh, de and using AML as the excuse for wholesale de-risking rather than apply the proper um, risk-based approach. So mm. this also is a changing space, I think. We're going to see um, a, a new emphasis, I think, from the, the anti-money laundering, um, well, I suppose, they're the, they're the standards body, aren't they? Yes, but, but you, you said it yourself that uh, Financial Action Task Force does recommend a risk-based approach and so the question is whether governments, regulators, enforcement authorities are able to assess the risk 
And, uh, and do they then understand sufficiently the market, the models, how it works? In order to assess the risk, mm. otherwise we face, you know, disproportionate rules mm. and enforcement. Keeping an eye on the time, do you think, mm. guys, this would be a, an opportunity to throw it open? Mm. Shall we take some questions from the floor? So it favours. I didn't hear that. It it, it leans towards larger organisations. <coughs> Is that for me or? Yeah. Oh, I thought you said Roger. I'm sorry. Yeah, I did. Uh, uh, no, no, no. It's okay. Welcome we, we to look Greg. Right. Um, <laughs> no, I do think it's a risk. I mean, I think you know the nice thing about Silicon Valley is that generally smart ideas, well executed, succeed. And now a lot of times there's the money follows those ideas and those and the excellent talent. But um, but I do think there's a risk because you you have to, to to go meet all the regulatory requirements of all these different states and have compliance officers and all the training is very expensive. And so there's a lot of companies that are either going to decide, I'm not going to get into that space. I also think, you know, with the regulations, too, that, that require the 10% owners, for example. So, you know, it's, the funny thing is most VCs, when they come into your companies, say, I want a lot of that company, as much as I can for my dollar. Now I bet you what you're going to say is, I only want up to 9.9%, because I don't want to disclose all my financial information. And that's a huge hurdle. And, and, and it's a real disincentive for people to invest lots of money. So I do think, I think it's, I don't think it will completely stifle things because Silicon Valley is so dynamic and things change so quickly. Um, but I do think it's, it's definitely an impediment and it makes it much harder for the, mm -hmm. for the small startup. Also, I mean, there's, people are just gonna say, do I wanna risk like, you know, you know getting banged by a government en entity and having my career tarnished for this startup? It's not worth it. You know, and I think so. I think you're gonna. There's a risk. You find a lot of good talents moving into this space. I mean, that's one of the things. What's amazing about this space is how many smart people and energetic people are in it. And I think that's there's a real energy. I've been to some of these conferences where it feels like a revival. Um, and so it's a great thing. But I do think. I think the. But I. I think your premise is not is not completely faulty. <laughs> So, so that's an interesting question. Um, you know, like with New York, there were so many comments from so many different entities, and you know, and typically comments are from the top to the bottom of the eco economic sphere. I, I don't think so. I mean, I don't really know. It's a really good question. I, I think that, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, I used to be a government guy, so you know, I think government does try to do the right thing, and I think New York's trying to balance, you know, the consumer interests with innovation. I mean, the interesting thing is New York's going to run that. New York is one of the, the places in the world that really gets this technology. In the US, there's two places, really. I think you know, California and New York are really dynamic. Are they going to run a risk that the companies in New York are going to get out of New York? There's potential of that. So that, that's a potential problem, too. It doesn't only affect New York, though. It affects everyone everywhere in the world, mm -hmm. because the, the, the proposal, even in its second yeah. stage, has a huge extraterritorial um, uh, reach which, um, well, I don't know if that was intended or not, but it effectively applies, <laughs> as so much American financial uh, legislation seems to apply, globally. Um, no, it's true, because it, it does have the provision, essentially, if you have one user, essentially, in New York, 
you're in New York. And that's indeed, what we, I've seen clients with that issue yeah. in other states too. And, and indeed, it's not even as simple as that. It's, it's a, a term that I don't think I've seen before, which is involved with New York or involved with a New York this, resident. Yep. So this is a, a very wide term. Uh, that, uh, and you have to make sure that every party to the transact, any one transaction, has no involvement. So this is not as simple as, as geo-blocking, which is, say, what the e-gaming industry largely does. This, you know, geo-block the US, keep it out, mm -hmm. put, a, put a sign up on uh, the start of your website. Mm -hmm. um, have you got anything to do in New York? No, I don't, fine, OK. But that doesn't mean your counterparty in this transaction that you might be facilitating may have some involvement with New York or an involvement with a New Yorker and suddenly you're caught by this um, a piece of legislation that says, you know, if, you, if, you should, if you're licensable, if you should have had a license and you operate without a license, it's jail time, you know. Please wear one of our orange jumpsuits. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the US is pretty good at, at, at trying to reach out to other parts of the world and, uh, and pluck people, mm. you know, extradite people back. There's, there's this case going on with the New Zealander, Kim.com, uh, and uh, when they couldn't get him, he's fighting extradition, they managed to, a, a civil suit to, to, to capture all of his assets everywhere in the world, mm. um, which he couldn't defend because he was a flight risk, because he, he, he wouldn't come to New York because he was fighting mm. extradition. It was a great, great, mm. you know, so we'll, we'll get you wherever, we, wherever you are, and this is obviously a worry, isn't it? Mm. And just on, on, on the um, controller point, I've been involved with transactions on payments and e-money side where it, it altered the whole structuring of the transaction because someone didn't want to become a controller. Mm. They wanted to stay under under 10%. Mm. And so it, it has a real impact mm. and the, you know, the global reach point is, is vital. So if my vision, if I can just share, share that, which isn't going to happen, but it's, it's, a, it's a good vision, which is to um, have <coughs> minimum international standards in this area so that it doesn't matter if there's such a long arm because the standards will be similar. And that, that could then lead to a, a global passport so that anyone who's licensed in a, in a FATFA-recognised country could then go and, be, and trade and have involvement with people in... Uh, other jurisdictions that also fat for recognition. And out of the window goes, <laughs> goes, goes the whole notion of jurisdictional arbitrage and mm. the benefits of being able to attract a few more investment dollars. You don't need to, in, to, to attract them to London because, well, if you license Well, no, well I mean, well, then we'll have governments competing to in, in, invite those to their territory with tax and other, other benefits because the regulatory regime will be Level more playing even. field, mm. a bit well, like Europe. You're, you're, <laughs> well, you're seeing it now. I mean, there's a lot of com companies that would be in the U.S. Mm. but for the regulatory structure. And so you have people in Luxembourg and elsewhere that would prefer to be in the U.S. but for the uncertain regulatory structure. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think, I think yours is a dream, Roger. I don't think that will <laughs> happen. But, um, I can dream. Yeah, you can dream. But, uh, but so it is having, it is having mm. business impacts, mm. without a doubt. Are there any other questions? One down here in the front. Um, so uh, basically, same question for the federal regulator. Uh, it's small country with very radical borders. Uh, two weeks ago, Russia had a fast track narrow ISIS that forced about 30% of the party power from a single Maoist party. Only two days after Kim's speech, the government issued uh, proposed jurisdictional arbitrage and domicile of the Kim's and Scotland, when it when it gets um, uh, its independence that it seeks, yeah. absolutely. I th I think most legitimate I think illegitimate mm. business businesses it might be kind of interesting, right? The less less government, the less control, the better. Um, but I think most businesses at the end of the day like certainty, and um, and I think an environment where it's very uncertain and things are changing constantly, including the value you know value of assets, etc. I think it's, um, I'm not sure that they're going to want to go into that environment. The other thing is, where's the talent? You know, this is a very talent-driven industry. The amount of talent it takes to, to bring these companies to the next level, to bring their products, 
to make it work is phenomenal and getting the best and the brightest. And so I think where the best and the brightest are is where those companies are going to go as well. You could argue that the UK is making that play right now in a way with um, its um, this new government policy that's a holistic policy that is very encouraging and, uh, and yet is balanced in that it is addressing some public policy issues, rightly so probably, uh, on the one hand, whilst at the same time you know, giving with the other and saying, you know, here's some money towards it. Here's, here, you know, this, this place is a good place to bring your, mm. your crypto business. Um, other jurisdictions, certainly those that I'm familiar with, um, small jurisdiction, the Isle of Man has just uh, uh, well, announced last year that, it, uh, that it's crypto friendly for reputable businesses. It's just passed uh, the two pieces of legislation that it needs to, to move that forward. And, um, uh, and, and one became effective um, on the 1st of April. The other is waiting for royal assent, so that will be in, in the summer. And, uh, and, and arguably, you know, that's a, a potentially mm. very attractive jurisdiction, although it, it does suffer the problem that it's, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily have the talent pool. But interestingly enough, so here's, here's where the, um, there's an interplay with other things that are going on. The, um, the Isle of Man has just uh, established a, uh, an IT university. So it's been working on this for three years. And it has funding from Huawei and HP and others. And will take about 1,000 students in IT. And obviously, it's going to focus heavily on the technologies, the, the niche technologies that it already addresses, such as e-gaming and space and one of mm. biomedicine and crypto, which is its latest sort of um, area of its latest niche. And so it's going to try and draw uh, talent to, uh, to the island with, 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 with the, you know, high-level education uh, that specializes in this field. So there's an interesting interplay going on there. Uh, Gibraltar's got some interesting proposals, and Spain, to which it is appended, um, whether it likes it or not, is, um, you know, is, is becoming quite a, 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 a tech hub. Uh, so you know, there's some potential going on there. And I wouldn't discount Greece, because if if they are forced into uh, a euro exit, I wouldn't be surprised. Well, their finance minister has written papers as long ago as over a year ago, um, supporting the idea of a euro-denominated future tax-based cryptocurrency. Um, has since come out with some other um, statements that may be taken as being, you know, uh, uh, that there could be some solutions, maybe only in the short to medium term, to solving a, a, a Grexit um, scenario, I wouldn't, wouldn't discount it. Very cool. Mm. Mm. I think we're being signaled to, to wrap up, um, but I'm sure three of us, if anybody wants to you know, pick our brains uh, offline, we're, we're around for a while. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you.